Hey guys, welcome to the next episode of the Refuse to Lose podcast. Today's chat features recently retired NRL referee Gavin Badger. The Badge is one of the most popular referees of the past 20 years, and throughout this chat we get into all the burning questions about his career, including who was the worst player to referee, the best sprays he's ever received on the field, the worst calls of his career, the best players he's ever seen, plus heaps more. But Gavin's story off the field is also an incredible one. He is a survivor of child sex abuse, a secret he carried for more than 30 years after his attacker threatened to kill him and his family. And throughout this episode, he goes into incredible detail about the battles he's had to fight because of that, and eventually opens up about how he found his voice. Gavin has also never met his father, and therefore didn't discover his indigenous heritage until much later in life something that gave him a much greater sense of identity and belonging. This talk is so enlightening, it's terrifying at times, but it's also very uplifting. So I hope you enjoy my chat with Gavin Badger. Gavin Badger, welcome to the Refuse to Lose podcast. Thanks hey, for mate. having us, mate. Yeah, thanks for having me. Mate, uh, as we sit here and talk, your, your NRL refereeing career of almost you know close to twenty years has has come to an end. How are you feeling about it? Uh, there's a bit of sadness in there. Um, not so much for the you know not refereeing each week. It's um, to, I've said a lot that what I do it's like being at school. It's like being a big kid. You know, I sort of get given a schedule at the beginning of each week where I've you know what days I've got to train and where I've got to be, and then footy on the weekend. So it was just, it's just like I've never left school. So I'm going to miss that stuff, the interaction with the rest of the squad and hanging out with my mates every day and getting paid to do it. Yeah, so obviously probably not the way you wanted it to end, as you, as you mentioned. It just kind of probably snuck up on you a little bit. Oh, yeah, 2020, you know, and COVID sort of threw spending the works to a lot of things. And, um, yeah, as someone who'd been around for a long time and done it for a long time, I would have loved the opportunity to... Um, you know, finished my last game in the middle and referee one more game of footy. Um, I hadn't refereed since we come back um, after round two. Um, and that's just the fact that there was only, you know, eight opportunities per week and I wasn't um, deemed to be in that top eight each week, which is, you know, it's sport and that happens. Um, I was filthy for a couple of days, to be quite honest. And when that last round came around, and I wasn't appointed to, to referee a game. But um, that sort of went away real quick when I got a lot of positive feedback um, through social media, through text messages from pl- current players, ex-players, um, people I'd never met. Um, there was so much positivity and I thought, for, you know, really for a referee who generally gets bagged out most weeks to, to get that positivity pretty much um, off the back of being pretty disappointed, sort of, it, it went away pretty quickly. Yeah, it, like some of the people you got messages, I saw Josh Jackson give you the game ball afterwards, which was a really nice touch. But as you said, referees aren't usually the people that kind of get that, uh, I guess, applaud, uh, like applause and, and thanks. Like, what was that like? To, and, and some of the people you had reach out to you? Yeah, I had a lot. Um, and it's funny, like Adam Blair, who's someone that I had a lot of running battles with on the field, and we had a lot of, yeah, I refereed Adam a lot and um, have a lot of the utmost respect for, for what he's done in his career. And he reached out, which. Um, you know, it was pretty special. I had Adam Reynolds, I had Josh Adokar, who I've, you know, that family connection with for a long time. You know, I, I could just keep rattling them off of, you know, a lot of ex-players that I've become friends with as well outside of footy um, that reached out. Um, and like I said, plenty of people on social media and a lot of them who have bagged me in the past were, you know, were, were quite f- forward in saying, you know, generally, you know, I don't mind sitting on the other side of the fence yelling at you, but you're someone that I've enjoyed watching because we think you're fair and we think you really look like you enjoy what you do out there and, and that makes a big difference. You seem to be a referee yeah, watching over the years that someone who's always had a good rapport with players and there's a criticism, I guess, of referees sometimes is they can be too robotic or they can not kind of relate to the players, but you've always been someone who's had a joke, had a laugh, but, you know, maintained your, I guess, position of power on the field, but you've always been comfortable kind of, I guess, showing a bit of personality. Was that fair to say? Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, Yeah, for me, you know, I I love rugby league. Uh, I, I started playing when I was three years old, and it's been the most constant thing in my life. And yeah, I, I really love rugby league. And if if I wasn't involved in the game now, I'd be on the other side of the fence, you know, paying my, my money to go and watch every week because um, I still do it now. I go, you know, when I'm not officiating, I'll go and watch games all the time. Um, and to be able to go out there and be a part of it, you know, might I would have loved to have any talent to to play rugby league at any level, you know, higher than just park football. Um, obviously, not good enough. But to then be able to go out there and do that, it's it's a dream come true. And you know, why wouldn't I sort of enjoy every minute of it? And, yeah, for me, 
you know, the rapport with players is people talk about, you know, respect is earned, but for me, I give respect straight away. So for, you know, if, if you know, someone who's played first grade football, if, I'm, if they're on that field, they get my respect straight away because I know what it would have taken to get there. So I respect everybody and then it's up to them to lose it. And there's not too many players on the field that I've lost respect for. So it, it, it's easy to have that rapport with players when you have that much respect for them. And then, then I think by me doing that, they, you know, they show it back. It's funny you should mention that because we were just talking about a, a guy that we both know in Preston Campbell and I did a podcast with him uh, recently and he said that's what he said his mantra in life is give respect first no matter if you get it or not. And he gives respect to people, even people that he disagrees with and he thinks there's not enough of that anymore and he goes, if I give respect, eventually they'll respect me. Yeah, is, and that, it, is that how you look at it? Yeah, and even if they don't, I lose nothing. You know, if someone doesn't want to respect me or whatever, then I just don't have that interaction. I don't have a relationship with that person, which is easy, whether it be on the football field or not. There has been players on the football field where I won't, you know, I haven't dealt with them because of that situation. I'll just deal through their captain. You know what I mean? I just don't have interactions with them like I would with anyone else. And, you know, not everyone's going to like me and I'm not going to like everyone else. There are some people that I don't respect. You know what I mean? So I'm not going to say that, you know, everyone's kept their respect for me. But at one stage throughout it, I did, you know, I did respect that person. But... Um, yeah, and, and Preston's a good one. You know, he's he's been around for a long time in in the game and then outside the game in his community stuff. And um, I, you know, his mantra is, you know, I don't, th- I haven't heard a bad word ever said about Preston. So obviously he's doing something right. Yeah, absolutely. He's a fantastic guy, as we were just talking about. But mate, a lot's been made of a kind of your departure and and the politics around it. Like, can you can you clear up kind of what has happened and in, in why you've. Um, been told you're not needed next year oh yeah uh, mate there's politics in, in everything whether it be sport at the elite level or sport at, at you know community level um but it, that's not the overbearing factor anymore i'm there i've been there for 18 years um and had a good 18 years um the last three years professionally have probably been the worst for me like um i've just virtually every year gone backwards in my career um in saying that the last three years pre- uh, personally been the best for me um i've probably found out who i am more of a person over the last three years than I have over, the, you know, the 45 that come before it. Um, and some of that is due to, you know, the professional side dropping back. Um, for me, it started three years ago, sort of the slide out of NRL. Um, we had a season where we really had to, we, you know, as, as referees, we really had to go outside what some of us feel is natural. And, you know, there was a lot of penalties in games. We had that year where there were some games with 35 penalties and stuff. Um, that was a big end for me. I, I couldn't, I sort of couldn't. It just didn't feel right, and I sort of struggled under that system, and then got dropped from being uh, a head referee to the pocket referee that year. Um, that was the first year for a long time I didn't referee a semi final at the end of the season as well, and then from then on it just went backwards. So um, where as to this year where I wasn't even running ref- uh, refereeing games, which is disappointing for me in the fact that the current takeaway three years ago to what we've got now and the current way the game is played, I think I, I think I would have excelled. I think my style of refereeing, stay out of the, stay out of the way, um, jump in when you only really need to, let the players run around and, you know, and, and be the superstars and let the referee go home and no one talks about, um, really would have suited me. Um, and I think that's that's sort of got that little bit in my, in, you know, in my gut where I feel I, I probably could have really excelled under the under the current systems. Yeah, I think I think if you ask any rugby league fan, they'd rather watch the game this year than than probably three years ago. It was yeah, it was some tough times there. But mate, how do you how did you uh, yeah, probably harsh on yourself in terms of mate, what are you what 40, 47, 46 years old like refereeing at that level? How did you keep doing that? You know, these guys are prime athletes. You have to keep up with them. You have to be there for every call. How do you, how do you keep yourself there? Yeah. Um I remember when I first came into first grade, um, I was training with the NRL squad and, and, you know, I remember being in awe of some of the people that had Billy Harrigan, Stephen Clark, Tim Mander, you know, um, Paul Simpkins, some, some, some of the people that I think are, the, you know, <laughs> the, the, the greatest referees that ever refereed and they all in the same group. And I remember having a conversation with Billy. I was just this little skinny kid who um, sort of never, ever believed that I'd be good enough to referee first grade because I was always told I wasn't. Um, I was always told that I wasn't going to be accepted in that you know that 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 field and stuff like that being the kid and who I'd come from where I'd come from um and I remember Billy having a conversation with me about you've got to find something that makes you you something that makes you stand out he goes there's people that stand out for two different reasons he goes there's people that stand out because they're at the top of something or people who stand out because they're at the bottom he said find what makes you stand out and he said his was you know he'd change his hairstyles he'd do all different things 
um, off because he'd already established himself. But as a young referee coming through, you need to the coaches to see you. So I thought to myself about it. I thought, well, what's going to make me stand out? And I thought, you know, well, I'm going to be the fittest. I'm going to work so hard that I'm so far in front of everyone that people have to talk about me. And it took me a couple of years, um, but I really worked hard on fitness and, and, and you know, and learn a, a fair bit about myself. And at that time, we had a trainer at the NRL who's now the trainer at Parramatta, Trent Elkins, who, um, who really was pretty hard on us and knocked us around a bit. And um, once I got through some of those sessions and realised that I was never going to be broken and that I could really push myself, I just kept going and kept going and... Um, you know, it would have been ten. It'd be easily ten years since I've been beaten in a fitness test in our squad, and up until two months ago, we did when I still won in record time. So I continually made sure that I uh, I was improving. I tried different methods as well, like I tried different training methods, different diets, um, you know, d- different activities, different out- activities outside of of footy as well to try and help me, you know, diff- like rock climbing and stuff, like just different things all the time to keep me energized and and stop from getting stale. So. Um, which I still do now, you know, even, and I still will continue to do. What's a, what's a fitness test for the referees? What, what would you guys do? Uh, it's changed over the years. So we used to do yo-yo test, which um, most footy clubs would do at different times. It's a variation of the beep test, and it goes to level 24. And I remember when we fast, first started doing it, um, and I had a fitness trainer there at the time, um, Cameron Black, and I said to him, my goal was to finish the test. I said, do you, have you ever seen anyone finish the test? And I think there was two or three... Uh, European soccer players that they'd known of who'd finished it and it, I think it took me three years and I finished the test so I ran the test out so that was something that I'd really worked hard on and I actually in off seasons and that trained just specifically to beat that test yeah <laughs> um so and, and my goal I always said to him if I ever break the beat the test I should never have to do it again um so I got that and then um we do some other runs some sprint stuff and, and all that but now we do a 1.2k um, time trial over 100 metres so it's 100 meter, 1200 metre returns um, and we've only we only just started doing that last year we've got a new tr- uh, fitness uh, strength and conditioning coach this year David Boyle who played with South and been around for a long time that most people in footy would know and he started the 1.2 and um, my goal was to beat four minutes which is 20 second 100 over 1.2 k's and we did it the test probably two months ago and I just missed it I think it was I think I did 403 or 404 so I told the boys that I'm gonna have to come back every year until I beat it it. well mate it makes me tired just just listening to it um we'll get into the bit more of the refereeing and and your kind of career a bit later but I I just got to ask the uh the hot fire questions that everyone wants to know and uh about your time as a as a referee and I the 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 one I obviously the first one you think of is the worst player to deal with <laughs> if it is a, a back chat scenario is it someone who just constantly was at you who was the worst over your career do you think um I don't know if it's the worst but he was the hardest to deal with but it was it was the hardest because um He's probably one of the smartest footballers I've ever, I've ever had to encounter, and that's Michael Ennis. And people talk about Michael, and, and I've said this a few times, and I'm waiting for to, to Mick to um, have a shot at me, but um, he he made you like every time I was refereeing uh, Mick, whether it didn't matter what club he was playing for at the time, you knew that you had to be on your game, and you knew that if you made a decision and he was going to come and question it, he was coming to you educated. He knew what he was talking about, so you couldn't just bluff him. There's some players where they come at you, you can just throw out a, a throw, you know, throw away line or whatever, and, and they sort of just go, okay, and walk away, or throw out a couple of words, and they don't know what you're talking about, and you get away as it. But Mick would always know what he was coming at, and you always knew that he was going to have some smart comment to go with it to try and make you look bad as well, and because everything's recorded, recorded everything yeah, on TV, exactly. you've got to be ready. So if you're not ready and prepared, then you look silly, and um, yeah, there was plenty of prep going into games when I I refereed Mick, and there's some. Some really good um, encounters between Mick and I. I was so. going to say you'd almost have to be a, a referee, but a debater as well, because he just he comes at you and yeah, and it's not even about the because you can't sit there and debate. So it's more about trying to get one line in that's going to shut him up, shut him up, <laughs> <laughs> and get him out of your face as quick as possible. Sometimes it was not even saying anything. Sometimes he'd just come at you and I just look at him blankly, and just shrug my shoulders and walk away. You know, and I'm not going. I'm not even going to give you an answer on that one. Mick. Um, but I love that. I love being challenged and. Um, yeah, he, he he was one that constantly challenged. And so it's not it's not Cameron Smith because I know everyone that or everyone always blabs on about Cameron Smith, but the the number one hooker would be Mick Ennis as a as a talker. The hardest to deal. Cameron Smith like and and I actually spoke about this on radio the other day, and then it ended up being a news story for a couple of days. So I was a bit worried afterwards that I might get myself in trouble. But I spoke about Cameron Smith, and, and the thing with Cameron is he's just so professional. 
there's no, there's no one I've dealt with that's more professional than Cameron Smith, and that's why he was the captain of Australia. That's why he was the captain of such a you know a, a successful and talented Queensland side for so long, and that he has the respect of anyone that's played with him. Um, is that he knows when he can approach the referee, so he never gets turned away. You never see a referee say to Cameron, not now. You see it happen to other players because they come at the wrong times. There's, in, in the NRL guidelines, there's certain times when a captain can come to you. It's to stop them just coming in time-wasting when their team's under the pump. So he knows when he can do that. He also knows what he can and can't say when he comes here. He's never disrespectful, he never raises his voice, and he never uses language. As soon as someone uses language, because we've got microphones, we've got to turn them away. Yeah because that's the last thing we want coming over the air. Yeah. He never does it. So he does it professionally, and, and similar to Mick, but you know, not in a smart-ass way, Cameron will be educated as well, so he knows what answer he needs to get, and he'll, you know, and, and he'll work on that. So you know, very rarely we see Cameron either get turned away or dismissive or get into a heated argument with the referee. And by doing that, because he always gets those opportunities, everyone thinks that Cameron Smith gets looked after, or Cameron Smith's the, th- the second referee or third referee on the field. But... Um, it's just a fact. It really disappoints me the hate that Cameron Smith gets, and I can probably say that a bit more now that I'm not officiating him. But um, because you know how good he is to our game and, and and how good he's been for such a long time, he should be you know up there with the you know his name should be up in lights with the greats. Yeah. Well, that that leads me to my next question. Then, like referees are the front row seat to watching football games. Who is the best player you saw in your entire time in the NRL? I was luck- I say lucky enough. I was lucky enough to see probably one of the greatest footballers of all time in Andrew Johns. Um, didn't get to refer him a lot. Um, when I first came into first grade, um, Joey was sort of on, on at the back end. Um, but you know, I was in awe of, of him. Um, Cameron Smith, obviously, to you know, like I said, he he's definitely going to be an immortal of the game and someone that people are going to talk about for a long time and someone that's going to be, you know, whether it be coaching or administrating or something, it's going to be you know, well respected in the game for a long time. And, you know, to be able to share a field with him is pretty special. There's other, you know, there's other people that you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to be on the field with as well. Like I remember my debut game uh, it was South and Brisbane up in Brisbane and um, someone who's become, you know, someone who, who's become someone that I sort of an inspiration to me at the moment is Joey Williams, who played in that game. Yeah, and Joey quite at, well, yeah. Yeah, and at mm-hmm. that stage... I, I didn't know Joey from the next footballer and he was just another footballer on the field. But over a long period of time, we've become pretty good friends as well. And, you know, looking, it, seeing what he does now in his life, like it, it, it inspires me, but it also makes me tired. I don't know how he's got time for it all. You know, he's, you know, he's an advocate for Indigenous rights. He's an advocate for mental health. He's, you know, he's, he's a father. He's a, you know, a husband, you know. I don't know how he has the time to do it or you, know, you always seem active in, in, in something for the betterment of someone else. Um, you know, and, and to, uh, to, for me to look back now on my career and say, well, Joey was in my first game that I refereed. Um, you know, it's a pretty special moment. In that same game was, you know, Garth Wood, who, who I grew up with, Garth. You know, his brother Nathan and I played footy together. We grew up in, you know, around the corner from each other and as kids were, I remember getting in trouble. We was terrified of, of their dad Barry um, coming home because we'd be jumping off the back fence into the pool and stuff and if he caught us we'd be in for a bit of a flog and so we'd all run and um, we were scared of Barry um, and have and, and have Garth in that game as well was was pretty special so there's those little moments as well you know that in being around those particular players you know Daryl Trindle who another one who I grew up with you know and being on the same footy field as him you know we were kids as four and five year old no, probably a little bit older than that playing footy together at Zetland Magpies um, being on the same field, you know, NRL field as him and until recently Josh Adokar, you know, seeing what Josh has been able to, you know, to turn himself into as knowing what he was like as a kid, um, you know, they're, they're the moments that I cherish. What's it like refereeing guys, you know, personally? Oh, mate, it's just a job. I just go out there and I just don't look stupid so I can't, um, you know, it's happened to me my whole career, even before, like even refereeing part football. When I first started refereeing in the South Sydney district, um, I was refereeing players that I played with and against I grew up with. And I, you know, already had that to deal with. I remember, you know, sending off one of my best mates and having to sit at judiciary and got in tr- actually got in trouble because I was talking to him at judiciary before a hearing. Um, so, you know, that, that's been something that I've had to deal with my whole life. So, um, to me, once I get out in the footy field, it's just my goal is not look stupid. So I don't care who you are. I'm just going to make what I feels right at the end of time. Yeah, that's fair enough. It's a good, it's a good plan, mate. What about? Uh, and you don't have to tell me the player, but is there a, is there a, a, a specific? spray or line you copped or something that stands out to you is like oh wow that's that's the best one i copped in my career 
I've copped a few, and you know what? I probably I, 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 I don't mind mentioning a player because same thing. I've we have a lot of mutual respect, and we get on pretty well. Um, I've had some pretty big sprays from uh, Jared Rua Hargraves. Yeah, okay. Uh, I remember one where I probably overacted a little bit and sent him in the sin bin, but. Um, uh, yeah, he's given me a couple of good ones. Adam Blair's given me a couple of good ones and, and smart ones as well. I remember I refereed Melbourne Storm the week they lost all their points from the salary cap scandal. Yeah. So I refereed them down at Etihad Stadium. It was against the Warriors and I knew it was going to be a tough night. But I remember the first penalty I blew against – no, I remember it was even before I blew a penalty. Adam Blair was offside and I called him back. Adam, get onside. He goes, what are you going to do? You've already taken all our points off us. <laughs> I thought, oh, here we go. This is going to be fun. So he'd just give it to me all night. Now, at the end of the night, when, after the game, when he came up to shake my hand, I said, you know I'm not the NRL. You know I don't make those decisions. Like, please look after me. Um, so, yeah, he's someone who's, who's often given me um, quite a good one. But I, I tell you, the, the worst one for me is – and you know, cops sprays off him all the time, and all the referees do, but he's the loveliest bloke in the world, and he's the first to apologise to you afterwards, is um, Jake Travojevic. Uh, I, yeah. Jake is yeah. a silent assassin. He will rip in, and then as soon as he's finished, he'll look at you and go, and he'll almost be crying in tears. I'm so sorry. And he, I remember speaking to him once at one of their training sessions, and, and they were talking, like they were asking me about, you know, how can they be better? And I said, well, Jake can stop abusing us. And he was almost in tears and so apologetic. And I actually felt sorry for him afterwards. And, and, and he goes, well, how can I be better? I said, well, stop blowing up. He's, you, know, you don't have to apologise if you don't rip in. He's so competitive, Jake. He, yeah. mate, he's, he's the nicest guy in the world, but he, he cares so much about winning. Yeah, like he, he does. He do, and he, he, is, he is one of the loveliest people I've met. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's funny. I do see that on the field sometimes. I go, that's so far from his character, but he just he wants he to just win loses. so badly. There's, there's plenty of those over the yeah. years, though. They're the best people you'll ever meet on off the field, but as soon as they cross that line, they're just a different person. Jared Ray Hargraves is one. He's, 100%. Yeah. You know, Jared Loveliest off field, guy off the field. But he just, he just sees red and just goes at you. Um, there's plenty of those. You know, you, in the, it happens every week. There's certain players that you just go, really? You just said that to me? And then uh, – and, and then, Immediately afterwards, they, they apologise. So. Do you have a, uh, a moment that you look back on, you say you, you go out there to not look silly? Do you have a moment where you go, oh, fuck, I look bad there? I've had plenty. <laughs> I, say to, I, I say to young referees, and I say to people when they give me a spray as well, or even you know, people have shot, say, oh, I think I've ruined more first grade games than you've watched. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've had quite a few. I remember a game, uh, 2008, I think it was, yeah, I remember it, uh, down in Melbourne. I refereed Melbourne and St George. It was a Friday night game. I think, and it was, a, it was a big game. And in the paper all week, St. George were talking about, I think Nathan Brown was the captain, the only way to beat Melbourne is to bash them. The only way we're going to beat Melbourne this week is if we you know, take it up to their forwards and bash them. I remember thinking, okay, well, I've got to make sure I keep a lid on this. And there was a scrum, and they were packing in, and it was Jeff Lima, and Jeff Lima was Melbourne uh, prop, and Jason Rolls was the Dragons prop. And I remember... You know, they were at each other and I, and I stopped the scrum and I called the two of them out. I said, look, if there's anything in this, I'm going to sit you down. So they go back into the scrum, pack their heads in. Jeff Lima stands on, uh, in hindsight, I didn't see this at the time, Jeff Lima stands on Jason Rolls' foot and stomps on him. I don't see that. Jason Rolls kicks back. I see Jason Rolls kick. I overreact, send Jason Rolls off. Missed the whole Jeff Lima thing. And at that stage in 2008, the reason they put me on that Friday night game is because I was sitting near the top of the referees and, and refereeing really well. Um, and it was going into the back end of the season. So I think they'll put me out there to see, um, you know, getting ready for the semifinals and stuff like that. Um, yeah, you watch back the tape. The stomp comes first. The kick is the, you know, the slide. It's not even – it barely touches him. So it's a massive overreaction. I get dropped for seven weeks. Um, seven weeks? Yeah, seven wow. weeks. Because uh, it was back in one ref days as well before we went to two refs. It was probably almost – it was almost the end of my career. And it was, we talk about people very rarely are on the front and back pages of the paper. I was on the front and back pages of the paper. I remember Steve Roach come out and um, I, was, I, I used to love Steve Roach as a player, but I remember him coming out in the media saying it was the worst decision in rugby league history. So uh, I made history that night. So that's <laughs> one that, that really stands out, but there's been plenty of others, plenty. Mate, like uh, leads me into, I guess, what's that like? What's that like being, they talk about the pref- pressure referees are under, um, and you want to go home having no one talked about you at all, but then to see yourself back page, front page, the pressure, like do you want to leave the house? How do you, how do you deal oh, yeah, with that? It's, it's, it, yeah, it's, originally it's sickening. So there's times on the field, and that was one of them, and there's other times where you make a decision, whether it be for a try, whether it be just a normal decision, and you take a peek at the screen and you see you're wrong. So automatically you feel a bit sick because you don't want to um, negatively influence a game. As a referee, you want to you know be as perfect as you can be, walk off the field like you say, and go home, and no one cares. 
Um, so when you see a decision, and especially when you know it's going to be a big one and a controversial one, um, you feel sick in the guts for yourself. You feel sick in the guts for the rest of your team, you know, because in refereeing, you know, one of us have a bad performance and the whole rhetoric around refereeing that weekend be the referees are hopeless or whatever. So you know you're letting your rest of your, you know, your teammates down. Then you've got to deal with the weekly, you know, and, and, and in this modern era you've got seven or eight TV shows that they're going to continue to play it on. You've got social media where you get hammered, um, newspapers. And for me, I, um, I own that. I go out there and I do it and I make the decision, but it's my family that, that has the impact of that. You know, I've got, I got a brother who's a bit of a hothead and, and he's a plumber and he works on building sites and um, I'm surprised he hasn't been sacked many times because I know he cops it a fair bit and uh, he's got the shortest fuse in the world, so I don't know how he restrains himself. You know, I've got my mum who's down the shops and that and she's quite proud of, of my achievements, so everyone knows that she's my mum. So she cops it a little bit. And then, you know, I've got kids at, I had, well, at that stage, I had kids at school, um, you know, and, and they've got to deal with it as well. So it's harder on them than it is on me. It's water off a duck's back to me. Um, I heard, you know, one of your earlier podcasts with Freddie where he talks about, um, for me, you know, I, I don't listen to anyone that I wouldn't take advice off, which is very similar. I, I think Freddie said a similar thing. Um, and that's something else. So if someone writes something about me or someone puts something on social media or someone wants to talk on a show about me um, negatively, that's fine. That's their prerogative and that's what they get paid to do. But at the end of the day, if it's not someone I'd take advice off, I, I probably I, I can let that go. Um, but it, and, and, you know, the fact of leaving the house and that. And, and I've been someone as a referee um, who stands out a little bit. You know, I mean, I've got a little bit of a, a presence that people, you know, people recognise me when I'm out. Um, so yeah, it is embarrassing. So you do try and stay away from crowded areas because you, you know, someone's going to want to talk about that decision, and you know, you, you speak about it all week. And yeah, it, to me, it's just embarrassing. Is it is it too much? Is like is the criticism and I guess the the microscope referees are put under. Is it too much in the modern game? Uh, it can be, but that's the, that's a byproduct of being in in a sport that people want to talk about. You know, I mean, if you want the game to thrive and stuff, you know, controversial moments are going to be talked about. If you want people to be employed in the game, you know, you know on TV and, and print media and, and, and so what, so, you know, and, and all those other mediums, sort of, as unfortunate it is, it's, it's, you know, a, a byproduct of that. You know, if we want our game to be noticed and, and recognised and successful as the number one sport in the country, um, some negativity comes with it. Yeah, I think we are over scrutinised. I think. There's not too many sports in the world. I know there's a little bit in AFL and stuff where the fans know all the names of the officials. You know what I mean? It's, you know, there's not too many. I'm, I'm a massive NFL fan and, you know, there's a couple that I know um, of the officials there and I think that's because I am an official and I sort of take a little bit, I, I look into officiating in that sport as well a little bit, but um, none of my friends can tell me, you know, the NFL officials' names and they're pretty big NFL fans as well. And, and I think that comes from the scrutiny that we're under. We get you know, a lot of scrutiny. Has it ever crossed the line uh, in terms of maybe an interaction with fans? Like we've seen, obviously, there was that uh, Good Friday episode where the bottles were thrown at, at Jared Sutton and a couple of other referees. I've been outside uh, a game and I've seen kind of, I think it was Henry Perinara leaving after a match at Leichhardt and guys giving it to him. Like, And it, it was kind of scary and you could see it in his face that he looked scared that you know there was these people kind of confronting him. Has it ever crossed that line for you or have you ever had that kind of gone too far moment uh on, there's some stuff on social media that is and some private messages that people send you that um is you know is quite ordinary um but you know i can't control what what people want to put on social media and that's up to them and, and they're the ones who've got to sleep with sleep at night with knowing that they've done that stuff but um generally the the fan stuff isn't too bad i haven't really copped it but you speak about the henry thing and i know exactly the night you're talking about because henry speaks about that night um he had his kids there so his kids were waiting for him out the front, and that was what upset him. He wasn't scared. Like, you know, Henry's a pretty good, big guy, and Henry can look after himself. But, you know, he, he, he's one of the, the nicest people you'll ever meet, and, you know, he's a massive – his kids are his everything. And he was more worried about his kids because they were there seeing that towards their dad, and, you know, that he doesn't want to see people, you know, saying stuff and carrying on like that to their dad. So um, he, that, he, that really upset him that night. Yeah, I, I remember seeing it and I was like, oh, that's that's too far. But, you know, people have had a bit to drink and things like that can happen and it's, and it's sad. But what about the actual state of refereeing at the moment, mate? Like it, it's so talked about. We've gone from one ref to two. You know, I listen to Gus Gould's podcast and every week he's kind of – Yep, <laughs> I listen of, to him as well. Kind of giving it to <laughs> you guys um, for better or for worse, you know, that, uh, you know, that they're overcoached or they're – 
they've got no feel for the game. Like how how does those things sit with you? Is is it is there element of truth? Is there no truth at all? Oh, one hundred percent. There's some element of truth to it. Um, but that's I think what happened with referee. And I spoke earlier about the the group of referees that I came through following. Um, so they're the group that I sort of gravitated to and they're where I learnt my skills as a referee and you talk about my personality and stuff on the field and I got that from those guys and what happened pre-full-time referees was that um, every referee was different you know, and they all had a skill set that made them a first grade referee they weren't the same so Bill Harrigan was not the same referee as Sean Hampstead. Sean Hampstead was quite a loose referee and tried to let everything go. Billy was, you know, a bit more around, you know, running around the field and, and trying to get the game as quick as he can. You had Steve Clark, who was, you know, the enforcer. You know, they all had different traits that made him a very good first-grade referee. When we come to full-time professionalism, um, unfortunately, part of that was that we had to try and be a lot closer in how we officiated as a group. And then when two referees come in, that, that just jammed it closer. So you had to take, well, I don't know if you had to, but the theory was we take personality out of it and everyone be the same, almost, almost robotic, yeah. almost, where it got to a point where watching footy became almost robotic in what people said and how they said it. And all the referees used the same phrases and, you know, the same terminology with everything and, you know, the same structure of how they refereed the game. Three penalties, call the captain out, one more, someone's going to... And everyone knew it was coming yeah. and it became robotic. Um, hopefully, I, you know, my... My wish is that going back to one referee, as much as I still think we should have two on the field, but going back to one referee um, will allow people to show their personality more because some of the referees um, at the NRL level now have great personalities. They are r- really good characters that um, you know, I'd love to see their personality come out in the field because I think it would enhance their ability to, to officiate the game. To me, the biggest personality I've ever seen in rugby league refereeing was Steve, uh, Steve Lyons. So Steve Lyons was around, you know, he'd probably been out of the game close to 10 years now, but he was the biggest character you've ever seen and his character was on the field and he was just loose, but that was how Teddy was. So he, he, he was able to referee the same way he was as a person, which you know, wouldn't be acceptable now because he was probably a bit too loose, but he was able to do it. Um, and he was a character. He was the biggest character that refereeing's ever had. Um, I don't think we'll ever see another one, but we've got a couple of people in our squad now that are pretty close to him, but they can't show that on the weekend. Um, it sort of gets drummed out of him a bit. Yeah, and um, and I think the players, as you said, respond to that well. If they see, you know, they don't think they're just kind of talking to a, 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 a for better lack of a, word, a walking rule book. And they see someone who kind of understands that, you know, it's not black and white. A lot of the time, it's it's very grey at different times, and you know, there's interpretation of the rules, and then there's, as you said, we said before, subjective. So someone can watch you referee and think you were the best referee on the field, and someone can watch you and go. You stuffed up this, this, and this. Who gave and him his ticket? Like yeah, that. exactly. Oh, hundred percent. And, and I uh, and I personally think probably the best referee we have in the game is Matt Checken, um, and I think that's exactly what he is. <laughs> when when he's on the field, Matt Checken is Matt Checken. He's not anybody else, and um, and that's why he is the most loved referee in the game. He, he if there was a popularity contest, Matt Checken wins every day, um, and it's because of his personality. You know, he doesn't try and be anyone he's not and he'll go out there and he'll enjoy what he does and you know, if, if he makes a mistake here or two but it's for the betterment of the game, he'll wear that. If he doesn't fit the mould for a second and goes outside what's expected because that's what's best for that game that day, that's what Matt Chacon will do. So, um, And I think that's what the players and fans appreciate. Yeah, and it's it's great that we um, we got him back and it looked like they were going to lose him to the game there for a bit. So it's, yeah, he, I, I'd agree with you just as a, as a fan of the game. But Matt, we'll, we'll move on from the refereeing because I want to talk more about you uh, now as a person. And, and I know that refereeing for you is something that you started when you were very young but it, it was I've seen you talk about how refereeing saved your life uh what do you mean by that yeah um yeah I was a bit of a loose kid um got myself in a fair bit of trouble as a, as a kid um teenager growing up around Redfern and Waterloo and um you know we we had a a, a, crew, a crew of people that we sort of hung around that I hung around with in in Waterloo uh, specifically where you know we we probably weren't the best kids <laughs> You know, kids run around, and we and we did some things that we probably all regret now. But it, it was was what it was. Um, and at that stage, I was playing footy in that as well. And I sort of I was around that sixteen, seventeen. Uh, I was you know I had didn't have much direction. You know, what I mean, I, I didn't. I never. I've never met my father, so I had no father figure. I, you know, I, I wasn't in a house that was a disciplined house or a structured house. So I had no structure. You know, you know, I left school when I was sixteen. So I, you know. I had no education really. So I was sort of just running around and I was lost. Um, And one of my ex-coaches, I just, and I'm a massive believer in fate. 
Um, I just happened to bump into him up at uh, the shops in Redfern, and he he just he was an older guy, Neil Lewis, his name is, and um, he, he'd coached me for a long time at Zetland, and he just started refereeing. He'd stopped coaching and that, and he just wanted to stay in the game and healthy, and you know he wasn't a young fella. And he said, why don't you come and try refereeing? I think you'd like it. And I laughed at him. I hated referees when I played. <laughs> I was a little cheeky smart ass, and, you know, thought referees were out there to ruin the game and, and get up everyone's nose. But um, it took him a little while, but he convinced me. He said, well, just come and do the referees course. And I remember they were up to, they, they'd been running this course for six weeks, but they were up to the last week and they were doing all their tests. He said, come and just do the test. He goes, you know footy, you know, come and do the test if you pass and then see what happens. And I went along. I thought, oh, what have I got to lose? I, don't, I really don't even know why I went along because it wasn't something that me as a 16 or 70, I look back and I go, it's not something I would have done. Like, I don't know why I did that. Um, so I went and did it. And then straight away, I met a guy there, an older guy by the name of Reg Austin, who was running the course. And just his interactions with me and the way he treated me, um, I had this gravitation towards him straight away. And he was an older guy as well. And he was someone that I, I was just sort of like, this, this, I don't know what it is about this guy, but I like this guy. Um, so I did the test and that, and then they come back and they said, you, you've nailed this test. You've passed, you know, you know all the rules and that. And they sort of, because I just turned up that day, they sort of like, that's a bit strange. Um, you want to start refereeing next weekend? Uh, you know, what? Like I was sort of not sure what to do. So I went and did it. And I, I remember it vividly. It was down at Pioneers Park, down at Malawar. It was an under sixes game. It was riffing All Blacks in South Eastern. Um, and I remember there was this game and all these kids, just, they didn't know what they were doing. I didn't know what I was doing, but I fell in love with it. I don't know what it was or why, but I just thought I really, like, I really enjoyed being part of, part of it. And um, from then on, it just sort of it became uh, – well, for me, refereeing became – well, there were so many people that were involved back then that were all putting time and effort into me to make me better. Um, and I felt like I owed those people something. So whenever I was about to do something stupid or um, get myself into any trouble, I sort of thought about those people that were putting time into me and stuff and, you know, that I wanted to make them happy and, and reward them and, you know, make them proud of me sort of thing, if that's, um, you know, it's, it's a bit strange to say when I, I, I barely knew these people. But, um, and, and that group of people that South Sydney um, Referees Association sort of took me in and they sort of really, it's, you know, it's that group of people that were there that turned me into the person I am now. You know, I learnt you know, a lot of my values and, and, and morals generally through, through that group of people. So I'm indebted to them for life because um, I was on a slippery slope going nowhere in no direction. And, you know, from there, I, I you know, I, I got into the workforce and, you know, I, I started to use those same disciplines that I started to use in refereeing in work life and vice versa and, um, you know, put me on a path to being semi-successful. You talk about a you know, kind of slippery path you're on and, and um, obviously this – and this is something you've spoken about before is, is something you were carrying around with you um, from a young age, a, a, a horrible experience you had uh, uh, as, a, as a young man. Can you, can you tell me about that? Yeah, yeah. So I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse, so family friend, um, took advantage of me when I was 11. Um, something that for 35-odd years I'd kept – to myself, hadn't told anybody, um, and at this, at, at you know, from eleven, and, you, and it, you can see a noticeable um, difference in my school reports from then. So up until then, all the reports were generally around, you know, you know, well-behaved kid, always happy, you know, bright, you know, bright spark, happy to be around, you know, a pleasure to teach. And then you look from, and and it was same, it was around that transition into high school as well, which is always a difficult period for kids as well. Um, so then, you know, the 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 aptitude, so my work stuff was still the same. I was still getting okay results when it comes to testing and stuff, but then the attitude stuff was just dropping. It was like it went from being – it started to be the class clown because I wanted – you know, I always deflect and try and make jokes of everything to dismissive, to argumentative, you know, to disrespectful. You know, it sort of went – and it just got worse and worse and um, throughout my teenage years. So at the time, you don't realise that that's happening. You know, you just, I just thought that that's just, that was just, you know, you know, I didn't know that it was a byproduct of what happened to me. And, but I look back on it now and I know that, you know, I look at the time frame of it all and, and you weigh it all up and I go, well, that's definitely the reason why I went that way, um, why I turned to drugs to numb pain and, you know, at a young age and why I, you know, went down the path of looking for people to be around that probably weren't the best for me during my teenage years because I felt like I belonged and I felt like I had respect of people because of the things I did and the things that we were doing weren't right. But that's, 
you know, what I thought was getting respect from people around me. Tell me about not talking about it because people say this, you know, they carry it with them for years and years, but there's obviously a fear element for not talking. What what was kind of, I guess, the, the fear? You said it was someone you trusted, someone you knew, um, you know, what kind of keeps it in? Yeah, fear is a massive thing. Well, for me, I was threatened as well. So I was, um, when, it was, when it was done, I remember I was told, go and look in a cupboard and open the cupboard door and there was a shotgun in the cupboard. And I was told that if I tell anyone, that's for me and my family. As an 11-year-old kid, that's, you know, that's, that's quite devastating. So, um, so there was that fear for a while. Um, then as it goes on, you know, then through teenage years and, and one of the biggest regrets I had out of all this, that being an 11-year-old kid, I didn't know what had just happened to me. So because it was a man that did it to me, I thought it was a homosexual thing. So I was quite homophobic through my teenage years as well, which is something that I massively regret now. You know, I was, you know, I really, you know, thought that that was something that was a homosexual thing. That's what they did. Um, so, you know, I went through all that and then there was fear of telling anyone that because then am I, is, you know, am I now gay? And back in the, you know, late seventies, early eighties, it, it was, it, it was, you know, it wasn't like it is now. It wasn't accepted and, you know, people were vilified for, for, you know, who they loved. So, you know, that had an impact on it as well from my teenage years, so it was a big reason of not speaking up. Um, and then the longer it gets, the harder it is. Um, not wanting to say anything to my family at the time because of, there's a family friend and, you know, is it going to be turned on me? Are people going to see me differently? Like I said, growing up in that area, you had to be tough as well. And, you know, speaking about things wasn't tough. It was like, you know, just get on with life and, and do what you deal with. Then, you, then, then it gets to a point where you suppress it all. So I remember through, you know, I, I had kids young as well, so I had my first kids when I was just turned 20 years old. So then it was like, well, I put that out the way. I've got kids to look after now. Um, no, you're bringing it up now. And then you get through a point where it's, it's just too late. Like, it, w- what's the purpose of bringing it up now? So I, I sort of just forgotten all about it. And then it was, it was just through it. And I'd spoken to – the only person I'd spoken to um, or mentioned anything to was Casey. Um, probably five years into our marriage. So, you know, so I'd spoken to her and it was off the back of, you know, there'd be certain TV shows that'd be on and something that happened in that show which triggered memories which I'd just get up out of the room and walk out or she'd turn to me and there'd be like tears in my eyes and she, she, it was actually, for her, it was a good thing she thought I was an emotional guy but <laughs> it was more, I was, you know, reminiscing about stuff that happened. Um, so I'd spoken to her about it and then I think she set it all up just quietly but we went to Bali two years ago for New Year's Eve um, but it just happened to be the day after there was a, a paddle out for child abuse um, at Old Man's Beach in Bali run by um, someone who's an inspiration to me now as well, Damien Ryder, who is a, a survivor of child sexual abuse and is really out there in um, advocating, for, especially for men that have been suppressing stuff to, to speak up and stand up and, um, you know, and, and, and voice what happened to them to you know, ease that pain and stuff like that. And he's a, a massive advocate for child sexual abuse where he's run marathons carrying mattresses on his back and, you know, just crazy stuff to get awareness for, for, for the cause. So I went and, and did this paddle out in Bali and he was sitting there and he was telling his story and why he told his story and um, the impact it's had on other people's lives and, and it really hit me. And I thought, well, I have this small platform there. You know, maybe I can, you know, maybe I can help somebody. So I remember we went back to the hotel room that night. That was early in the morning and we went and trained with the whole thing for the day and it was playing on my mind all day. And I got back to the hotel room and I, I'm pretty active on social media and I put this post that I was going to send out on social media and I had it sitting there for about an hour thinking, should I hit send, should I hit send? And I showed it to Case and as soon as she read it, she started crying and I thought, what's well, the right time? And I just, I thought, I'm just going to hit it. And I hit send, turned the phone off and didn't look at it. And I thought, I'm not going to I'm just stay away from it. So the next day, you know, lunchtime, I turned my phone on and there was, it was berserk. There was messages, there was comments on the post and stuff like that, which was all positive because I didn't know how it was going to be. Um, put it and, and the post just said that it was more rap and Damien. It said, you know, um, I too am a survivor of child sexual abuse. Um, and off the back of that, I got a lot of really positive feedback and we got some stories generated in the press, which, you know, then put some stuff to the cause and that made me think, well, you know, it's something I'm going to put a lot of time into now. It's something that I want to have. That, that could be a little bit of my why and my giving back and, and maybe me being able to give that 11-year-old kid a voice. Um, and off the back of that, you know, I, I talk about, you know, I've had an 18-year refereeing career and I'm pretty proud of that, but my proudest 
my proudest moment is that is standing up and, and saying that and then the interactions I've had since I've you know the amount of people that have contacted me and said that it's enabled them to firstly speak up or it's enabled them to feel better about themselves or um, you know it stopped them from you know committing suicide and stuff I've had conversations with people where you know they've said you know I'm about to do this or whatever um, and I you know just through a phone call or whatever I've been able to have those conversations with them about my story and you know, it's it's that that's been the, the most amazing part of my life. Apart from uh, I take my kids sort of out of the equation, but to be able to have that impact impact on somebody else, considering it was such a horrific thing, a horrific thing that happened to me. Um, yeah, I, I I'm quite proud of that. And that's the thing, mate. Like, there's you're, I guess, in a, in a sense, one of the lucky ones because there are a lot of people that do lose their life to this, and they suffer in silence, and they just they can't take it anymore, and 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 that's the end for them. Like was was that ever a thought process for you or was it you more shut it out and it was just because other people can really bury it deep um you know what was that like for you that that mental battle over those that that time yeah it's been different at different times there have been times where and i've never attempted um suicide or anything like that um but there's been thoughts um there's obviously times throughout especially in the younger where you sort of sit there and think yeah is my existence worth anything to anybody or you know am i gonna is is this my lot in life and you know, is, is this what i'm destined for um so there's been those thoughts um there's been times like you say as well where i've been able to suppress it for years you know there's been you know years of time but it hasn't even come up and then like i said before to be a movie or to be something you see on tv um with the referees for more than 10 years we've been advocates for brave hearts as well so every year we do the brave hearts round and then that can trigger some stuff but um yeah like you, you speak about the lucky ones I, i'm definitely one of the lucky ones you know there's many people that if it's not at the hands of their abuser it's through suicide that um we lose a lot of um victims of child sexual abuse what about um i guess numbing the pain at times and you mentioned before uh drugs at different times in your life when you were young is that is that how you dealt with it at times yeah definitely through through my teenage years up until it was virtually having a kid that sort of knocked me about a bit and, and woke me up a little bit but um yeah i definitely i started smoking you know pot probably 12 um was you know speed and cocaine at 15 um not not to a point where it was uh you know going too far but yeah, it was definitely something that I used regularly to uh, pot, pot I used regularly, like I used every day for you know ten years nearly. Um, and then yeah, and it was just something. It was just to get rid of reality. Yeah, because I mean, you kind of played off like oh, you know, I wasn't using cocaine or speed to any kind of serious level, but it's not. It's not a normal behaviour for not a fifteen year old. No, no, I, no. And, 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 well, and, you know, the stuff you've got to do to get the cash to do it as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So what what is it like mate, now when you when you see, I guess, some of the injustices that still happen and, and obviously now the, the kind of the lid's been lifted on so much of it, like to to sit now and see it and, and, and continue watching. Sometimes, you know, justice probably isn't served to people. Um, how How angry does that make you? Oh, I'm forever angry around stuff around this. Um, uh, I'm generally not an angry person. I try and be a happy person, but there's some things that, that make me angry and some of the stuff in, in recent times is, yeah, almost tipped me over the edge. But um, for me, the, like we, we, we look at stuff in society over the last couple of years and the stigma surrounding it. Child sexual abuse is something where the stigma hasn't been lifted. You know what I mean? There's still a massive stigma around it and people don't want to talk and people don't want to believe that it happens. There's so many people in denial that it even happens. And you'd be surprised, especially in a modern era with the internet and social media and the predators out there, um, people just don't want to believe it happens because it's so horrific. People don't want to believe that they live in a world where the person sitting next to them could be someone who abuses kids. They just don't want to believe it. And the statistics say that you know someone that does it. It's just statistical. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's that rife. And I think the more that we get people stand up and talk about it and, and you know and, and push it out there that this is happening and we need and we need better ways to protect our kids. I speak a lot about like uh, social interactions with family. So we do it a lot, and in, in indigenous cultures, we're massive on it, where we're always telling you know, kids to be what I look at is intimate with our relations. And it, through intimacy, I mean, like, there's Uncle Joe over there, go and give him a hug. And the kid will say, no, 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 go and give your uncle a hug. What are you doing? 
You know what I mean? And, and this kid now feels like they have to be in an intimate situation that they're not comfortable with. The next day, the kid might run up to uncle and give him a hug straight away without even being told. So you don't force the kids to have interactions where they're not comfortable. If the kid wants to give Nana a kiss, they'll go and give Nana a kiss. If they don't, they don't. Next day, they'll, you know what I mean? So that, that's one of my biggest takes out of this because you're actually making it normal for kids to do something intimate that they want to... It might only be a hug, but a hug's intimate. You know, they've been hug leads to something, you know, and that's where the kids are then afraid to say no. So, we, you know, we're gonna, it's just stuff like... It's about educating yourself around how we can be better. There's an organisation that I've been working with of late, ChildSafe, where they go into industries and they teach their staff around this stuff. So that the staff are better educated and, you know, into sporting clubs and teach coaches and stuff, not only to, you know, to, to know what's right and wrong, but to see signs. You know, see this kids change, kids' behaviours change. You see a kid and his behaviour change. How, you know, how can we, we work to find out what's going on here or if there is an issue? Um, and stuff around that, you know, and it's just about, it, it is really much about educating and accepting that it happens and how do we, you know, and, and the fact that it does happen isn't good enough. If it happens to one kid, it's not good enough. Um, so let's put some time and effort and money into, you know, making sure that, you know, we, we protect our kids. They're our greatest asset. What about talking? How has it changed your life, opening up about it? Oh, uh, I'm a much better person. For, like I said, professionally, last three years have been pretty horrendous for me. Um, it's been a backward slide, but personally, uh, you know, it's been three years since I sort of spoke up about it. Um, firstly, it's made me understand, you know, it, it's given me a bit of pride in myself. Um, I never really accepted the fact that what, what I went through and where I got to and how I got to was something that should be celebrated, you know, and, and, and it's probably, you know, a, a fair bit of the Australian cultures where you don't celebrate yourself, you know what I mean? You sort of, um, and I've gone, you know what, to be able to do what I do and seen the impact that what's happened to me on other people and be able to stand up and talk about it now and hopefully educate people and hopefully save people's lives or hopefully allow someone to think a little bit differently about themselves. Um, that's something that I'm, like, I, I, I'll continue to say that I'm really proud of. Um, and, 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 and for that, that's why I owe rugby league so much as well because rugby league gave me that platform to do that. If I hadn't um, turned up to that referees course and started refereeing, had those people invest time and effort into me, I wouldn't have become the person I am now. I wouldn't have been you know, able to referee at the highest level and then I wouldn't be able to talk about what I talk about now. People wouldn't listen to me. Now I've got some small platform where I can be listened to. What about yeah, a support? You mentioned the messages you got straight away. Um, but, I mean, the support from... Like probably the NRL, the Referees Association, you said before that, you know, they sometimes try to take the personality out and they want their referees to kind of not be known. And But them being very supportive of you talking about these things and, 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 and being out in the public and, and I, I guess being that person and that face, you know, there's a lot of people that have kind of uh, that probably surprised you how many people supported you. The NRL have been amazing to me. Um, and... That's why, although I'm unhappy of how my career ended, I'll never, ever sit here and bag the NRL because I owe them everything I have. Um, great people in there. And like I said, and, and a lot of the stories I did was, was um, with Zach Bailey. Um, I owe a lot to Zach for the way that he treated my stories. Not only this one when it comes to the sexual abuse, but um, my um, Indigenous identity. I've done some stuff with Zach around that and he's been really respectful with that. Um, so I really owe him a lot because he created the platform for me to talk. Um, and yeah, just the, the the board and the staff at the NRL at the, at the highest level have been really supportive. And I, I, I'm someone who sp speaks out a little bit on social media, whether it be you know marriage equality, whether it be Indigenous rights, whether it be you know, child sexual abuse or mental health. It's something that you know I'm, I'm pretty passionate about, and they've allowed me that platform to continually do that. You mentioned marriage equality there, and I mean that just shows kind of how far you progressed, I guess, from someone who was really homophobic. In his in his youth to now being a, an advocate for that, you know, at, how did you get through that kind of journey? I I, I think it's just a, a lot of it, and, and this is probably rugby league. Why rugby league is so good is we allow people to have second chances and stuff. And and by seeing you know that in the game, people people and players, especially players, you look at players when they come into the game at eighteen, they're different than when they leave the game at thirty two. People grow and evolve and stuff like that, and it's, I think it's similar for me, although I came into refereeing later. But I realised early in my life, like at once I sort of got out of all this you know, um, crazy ride that I was on through my teen years and that, that, you know, worrying about what other people do and how other people do things and, and their lives, what's it, it's just going to add stress to my own life. So I don't care what anyone else does. As long as they're not hurting me or my family or, 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 or you know, it, it hurting 
other people. I don't care. So, if, you know, if someone wants to be a certain religion, if someone wants to marry a certain person, if someone wants to, you know, whatever they want to do, it doesn't affect my life. I don't care as long as you're happy. Um, and that was, for me, a, a big part of the marriage equality thing is that I have, um, you know, I have kids and stuff and I want my kids, if whichever way, you know, they want to love, I want them to be able to do that. You know, I, I shouldn't be telling anyone who they can and can't love. So, um, yeah, it's something that both Casey and I were quite passionate about. We actually, um, when the whole marriage equality vote and that was going, was something we spoke about and it was a campaign that we sort of did through and we used our platform through, through refereeing is that we weren't going to wear our wedding rings in um, NRL games um, until, you know, anyone could get married. So it was just a little thing that we did that we thought we could, you know, to show our support to, to all those people that they just want to love. Yeah, well done, mate. You, you did a good job there, mate. And it was obviously to show the growth that you had to to get to that point is, uh, I think, something a lot of people could learn from. Is that, you know, you don't have to, just because you've been one way for one way your whole life doesn't mean you can't look at something differently. But I want to touch on something else you you alluded to there with our good old Zach Bailey, good old eyebrows. He's <laughs> I wasn't going to I wasn't gonna say <laughs> that. Best like. eyebrows in the NRL, Zach. <laughs> uh, shout out to him. But, uh, mate, you, your Indigenous identity. Um, you know, I'm a proud Indigenous man, but I've known that my whole life, um, finding out. You know, you found out later in life. Tell, tell me about that. Yeah, it's a crazy story as well. <laughs> I, I could write a book, I reckon. <laughs> you should. Uh, yeah, so it, it's it's funny because obviously I, I, I grew up in Newtown um, when Newtown was Newtown, not what it is now. It was a, a bit of a ghetto and a bit of a rough neighbourhood and, um, you know, it was a lot of single parents and stuff like that. So um, it, it was pretty tough. So I grew up there and I played footy in Zetland, which is close to Redfern and that, and it was just through the fact that um, a friend across the road they were playing and they sort of um, took me there so that was my first footy club but it was a high population of Indigenous kids in that you know obviously being uh, in a city in Redfern um, in our footy side and for some reason I really gravitated towards all the Indigenous kids um, I even to a point where in high school I went to Cleveland Street Boys High School instead of my local school Newtown High um, because all my mates went there, even though there you know, was only a couple of kilometres in difference, but and a high Indigenous population in that school as well. Um, and I remember one of my mates um, talking to me about a lady who lived in um, the Housing Commission flats in Erskineville um, and how through different family connections that that was my grandmother. So I've never met my father um, and that she lived in, in Erskineville. So... Um, me and a couple of mates, well, she would have, I'm surprised she opened the door, but me and a couple of mates went around there one day, I would have been 14, 15, 16, I'm not exactly sure on the age, um, and knocked on the door. I think she would have panicked in the middle of Erskineville with three young hoodlums knocking on the door. Um, but I told her who I was and stuff, and she was sort of quite surprised and took me in, and she, she spoke to me about my dad. Um, and it was then I found out that he was an Indigenous man from up Kempsey Way. So um, it was quite surprising, um, but... Uh, made some sense. It sort of made some sense to me. It sort of gave me a bit of identity and it made me realise why I was who I was and I hung out with who I hung out with. Yeah. Um, well, who was she? So, so my nan, well, they're, they're cooks. So she's from the cook side. Um, but she was, um, from what I from what I found out post, she died not long after that, actually. Um, she was stolen generation as well, so she didn't really know her identity either. Okay. So, it, um, yeah, it's quite bizarre. My dad was a cook, so, um, and I've spoken to... I've got some friends that are cooks and stuff like that, so try and still trying to find any connections. I have no connection to family at all, um, so it's been it's been scary. Even even the fact of you know for a long time I didn't sort of know how to go about you know speaking my you know my past and stuff like that because I didn't want to be seen as one of these people who just jump on the bandwagon. You know we've got a lot of people who sort of jump on and want to um, claim you know certain things for certain reasons you know to, for, to, to gain or whatever or to, and I didn't want to be seen as that because I didn't want to until I found family and stuff like that and even if I found family they wouldn't know these sort of things so I didn't want to be to have it look like I was trying to claim something I'm not and I and, and I've never and it's something I've never I've never tried to claim anything I'm not but I've never spoken about you know or, or um, culture and stuff like that because I don't have a connection to it but I can speak about experience of what I've seen and stuff like that when I come to you know indigenous rights and stuff like that so I'm, I'm not going to stand up here and claim that I've ever been persecuted because I'm aboriginal because most people wouldn't know I don't have the look of an aboriginal and stuff like that so I can't claim all that stuff but I can I can, I can claim what I've seen 
you know, and growing up around Redfern and, and, and that I, I know what happens and I know what has happened in the past. Um, so my fight for Indigenous rights and Indigenous culture is, is based on what I know happens, not so, what's happened to me. Well, that's probably a, a perspective that many people don't have. Like, well, what what have you seen? As someone that is probably around and, and, and is is tr- is probably treated as a as a, a white person and, and no one really knew you know you've probably seen things that you know I, I guess indigenous people wouldn't see or they wouldn't people wouldn't, wouldn't say in front of them yeah and that's the and, and that that's a big regret of mine is that I never called things out earlier than I did um, sometimes you just sit back and and you know and you hear things and you don't say it um, it's uh, it's something I've over the last couple of years, I've said I will never do again. Um, but yeah, there, plenty of plenty of racism, whether it be outright straight to your face racism, or you know the hidden, you know, connotations of racism where people, you know, oh, it's just a joke. You know, I'm only joking or whatever. And, and not only towards Indigenous people, towards any culture. Um, and you know, <laughs> I don't want to get too political and stuff. But people that want to say that we uh, don't live in a racist country are kidding themselves because um, it's generally the you know, middle-aged straight white males will say that um, and they're the ones who've never seen it or have never been part of it. So you, you, you've got no right to, to comment on what you think or there, isn't, there is or isn't. Um, listen to the people that deal with it every day. You know, listen to, you know, it, it, it happens every day and, you know, we just got to listen to the people that, you know, that it, that it, that it's happening to and why they feel so strongly about it. You know, you see people say, well, it's only words. How can it hurt? You know, I've heard worse or, you know, it's been happening forever. What's it matter? Well, you know, how about we just, we just start to think about how that makes people feel if that's something that you have to deal with every day of your life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And look, there's been stuff in the, in the news even recently and it's yeah. still amazing that it's something we're talking, we're talking about, but I know, you know, every, Every uh, Cody Walker did a, uh, a chat yesterday, and he, he was just like, oh, I, "I can't believe we're still here." But you know, every little every little one's a fight. Every little one is a, it, it raises more awareness. It might catch more people, and more people think about it. So you that, know. that's where we owe a massive debt to the Michael Longs, and you know, even as recently as the Adam Goods and that of this world, um, who have given the current players the opportunity to have a voice. I've never seen a group of Indigenous players, and I'm not over the AFL, so I don't know exactly how, how they're treating it there, but I know they're doing a lot of good work there. But in the NRL, a group of Indigenous players be so proud to stand up and call stuff out continually. And guys that are at the, you know, the peak of their careers that in the past, if they'd have spoken out, their careers would have been ended. You know, you go back to the 70s and 80s, if some of our Absolutely. players were speaking the way they are now, they, their careers would be ended. And the fact, you know, young Brent Naden a couple of weeks ago up on the Central Coast who calls out people in the crowd, you know, that wouldn't happen 10 years ago. You know what I mean? So these, not only are uh, these young men great footballers, but they're great role models for indigenous, indigenous communities. What about for yourself, mate, when you found out you're an Indigenous man, what kind of sense of identity did that give you kind of instantly? And, and you're someone, as you said, that struggled for a lot of his you know, young life about knowing who he was or what he was about or what his purpose was because of what was taken from you. What about finding that out? What did it give you at that time? Yeah, it, it's hard. It's hard to explain. Um, <laughs> I, I got plenty of stories, but another story around identity for me was um, I'd carried all through primary school and at the start of high school, I'd carried a different surname than I have now. I carried my stepfather's surname, which was Bajaya, it's a Maltese name. Um, I didn't know that wasn't my name. And it wasn't until I made a rep footy side where we had to produce birth certificates and stuff um, going into the um, into camp where I produced a birth certificate that was different than the name that I'd been picked under. And the coaches were saying, well, what's going on here? Um, and I didn't know. So I had to, you know, no mobile phones and that back in those days. So I had to wait until mum come to pick me up from training and have an explanation that I had. I was using my stepfather's name, but my name, I had my mother's name on my, my birth certificate. I don't even have my father's name on my birth certificate. And... Already there, there were, and that was, I think I was 12 at the time, and that was already identity crisis there because I'd only been known as one person. So all my, if you look at all my old footy trophies and that from a kid and all my school awards and that, it's got Gavin Bajaya on them. And then from 12 and 13, then it's got Gavin Badger on there. When I, you know, I, I, As soon as I knew that wasn't my name, I went back to the name that is on my birth certificate. So I already had an identity crisis to start with, and then to find this out off the back of that, it was like, who am I? And it got me thinking, should I try and find my father? And it's something that Casey talks to me about all the time, but I didn't want, I, 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 you know, because for me, I go, well, is there a history of heart disease? Is there a history of, you know, all these different elements that could be there? And I think, you know, I, I, firstly, I wouldn't know what to say 
if I did if I did meet him and I'd be scared of what I'd say if I did probably. So I've never ever tried. I've never asked my mum about it. Um, that was going to be my question. Yeah. But. Yeah. N- never. I've never asked it. It's never been brought up actually. Yeah. Um, it's just. So it's just. It, it's it's just the elephant in the room. I think. Um, Is it something you ever think you you might come to? Or? I've thought like there's it, obviously times where I thought, especially when I had kids and stuff like that. I'm thinking, well, for that reason, you know, when you're starting to fill out forms at the hospital and there's a history of heart disease in the family, going, I don't know. Is there a history of this in the asthma in the family? Is there a history? I don't know. You know, has anyone died young? And I don't know. Um, so yeah, it gets you thinking. But then I think, well, you know, really, being a father now, um, if it, it, and I don't, I don't even know the circumstances of why my father's not around. Whether it was, you know, a fight with my mum if it just took off, or my mum, so it could, you know, there could be plenty. Of, and I've never asked. Same thing, um, because I know if it was me and it was my kids, I'd do everything I could to find them. So he obviously doesn't want to be found. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, that's. I mean, you've, you've. He would know. He would know of you. I'd imagine. So I'd assume so. Even back. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm. Uh, it's. It's. <laughs> yeah, I, quite a story. I, yeah, mate, it is. Like I, just, I, 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 it seems like, but you've, um, you know, you've made peace to kind of live how you without him, and you've have done all right for yourself. Like, is that how you feel? Like, oh yeah, my my mum, you know, as, as, as struggling as we were, single mum with five kids, um, you know, she did she did everything she could. We 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 got what we needed. We didn't have anything extra, but we got what we needed. I, I can't remember not eating. I can't remember, you know, not having lunch at school. So. We were sweet. Man, sweet. <laughs> um, culture, like it, it, when you see um, the way that Indigenous players are celebrated these days, and the and the way it's kind of goes from strength to strength. Um, play not just the way the players speak, but the way they're kind of revered in the game, and and people are learning about them. How does that make you feel? Yeah, it, it, like I say, I, it, this is one of the reasons why I love the NRL as a whole as well. Um, this year, you saw the beginning of the year, the ad came out and had Latrell draped in the flag. And I know the NRL got a lot of heat for it. Um, but to me, it was showcasing that, you know, we have great Indigenous players in our game and they should be celebrated, just like we have great Polynesian players in our game. And at stages, they've been celebrated. There was an ad, you know, with um, Roger Tuovasha Shek and his dad and stuff like that. So, you know, the, you know we, we celebrate the women's game. We celebrate, you know, all cultures in our game. Um, just because we celebrate one at a certain stage in, in, in time doesn't mean that we're not celebrating the rest. So, you know, we're allowed to celebrate Indigenous culture and I was really proud of the NRL for that. Um, yeah, and the All-Stars game, you know, we speak about Preston Campbell before and one of my proudest moments in footy is, is the uh, 2010 All-Stars game and being able to go and officiate that um, and how that's been celebrated every year. And I think the best thing that ever happened in that game is that we took it away from an All-Stars game and made it, you know, us versus Amari. You know, you know, th- that means something now. I, I don't think the game meant as much to the All-Star team as it did to the Indigenous team for a long time. Yeah. And now that we have that, you know, win, lose or draw, it doesn't matter. I think the result doesn't matter. The fact that the two cultures are, you know, out there embracing each other, um, you know, makes it even more special to me. Um, yeah, and, and the amount of superstar <laughs> Indigenous players that, you know, are now, not only are they great footballers, they're great ambassadors for the game. You know, you, you, I, I know for a long time the media were trying to attack Troll for, you know, some of the stuff that happened, you know, at the beginning of this season and stuff like that. But the way he's handled himself and the way he's come out of it, unfortunately now he's injured and he's not out there showing what he could do at this time of year. But, you know, for, he, people seem to forget he's still a young kid. Mm. You know what I mean? He's, he, he's not a 35-year-old man who can, you know, he's hardened to criticism. He's a young kid who, you know, was just being a young kid and looking after some mates and got absolutely poleaxed. Um, yeah, they did the wrong thing. You know, yeah, they should have been a bit smarter about it, but you know, there's been a lot worse and a lot, you know, and, and a lot less than made of it post. Oh, hundred percent. Do you have a favourite Indigenous player like that you watched over the years and thought, Jesus, that's amazing? Like even when they scored, you think you're blowing a try. I was like, did I just watch that? Um, before before even refereeing, my favourite player in football, and this is another reason why um, everything made sense, um, was Larry Corowa. Yeah. Um, the old the, the Black Flash at the Tigers at Balmain Tigers. The disappointing thing about that is uh, I've seen some Instagram posts, uh, some Twitter posts where Larry's absolutely hammered me on social media <laughs> uh, to a few of my friends. So that, that was quite disappointing when, you know, he's an idol of mine. And, um, uh, and just, you know, like we spoke about earlier about some of the players that I've really enjoyed being on the same footy field with and, you know, GIs. Mate, he's sensational. You watch Greg Inglis run, and it looks like he's jogging. Yeah, it's embarrassing. Like, yeah, you think run faster, but he's just so much quicker than everybody else. He just had the most impressive running style. Um, and yeah, I was 
I was fortunate enough to be on the field with Greg a few times when he's done some remarkable f- things on the field. I remember his run up in Brisbane where he... Suncorp Stadium? I was Were you running, there? I was, you running behind, I was running behind him the whole way. If you see the footage of it, as he's putting the ball down, I'm running in behind him with the biggest smile on my face. <laughs> um, I was also there when he gave that big friend to Jamie Soward as well. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, so, yeah, he, yeah. GI is probably the most special I've been on the field with. Yes, yes, mate. You've had a front row seat to some amazing things, I mate. To finish off, and I appreciate your time today, but I just I want to know what's what's next for Gavin Badger. Um, how the NRL's done? Uh, there's there's plenty I want to do. Um, at the moment, though, I've been fortunate enough for the last four years to be working part time at New South Wales Rugby League, yeah. uh, working in referee development and education. Um, I'd like to f- hope that there's a full time role for me there, and I've had some conversations. Already with Dave Trotten there, who's been, uh, I'll say it on here, so you know, hopefully he hears it, that he's a r- remarkable boss. Um, now I've, I've you know, had some um, talks with Trotter around going forward and working more in the Indigenous space there as well, so especially in refereeing. Um, I've spoken about it a fair bit. We look at the percentage of Indigenous players in the game, even Polynesian players in the game, compared to how many Indigenous or Polynesian officials we have. It's, um, the discrepancy is way out of whack. Um, so I'd love to be able to go in and... and you know, get amongst the community and, and get people involved in, in in refereeing as well and, you know, hopefully see some more Indigenous referees coming through the ranks. So that's something that I, I'd love to be a part of. And outside of work-wise, I'd like to get, excuse me, I'd like to put a lot more time back into, you know, the um, helping out with some of the education around child sexual abuse and, um, yeah, stuff around that sort of mental health space. So hopefully I can, I can spend a bit more time there. Mate, yeah, and you, as I said, you do incredible work and... The way you've told your story is is to be commended. Like I think, as you said, it's 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 helped a lot of people, and you've probably found that. And I think the next, however long you do it for, will probably you're hoping to have the the same effect, and and probably even more. Yeah, thanks, mate. I really appreciate it. Well, Badge, mate, c- congratulations on a wonderful career. You've been a great referee to watch, one of the great characters, and you know, so giving with your time. And so, thank you for coming on the podcast, mate, and, and sharing your story. It's a, it's a cracker. Thanks it's, for having me, mate. Hope we didn't take up too much of your time. No, mate, I've got to get to work, but thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for listening, guys. We've got plenty more episodes coming your way very soon. Don't forget to follow the Refuse to Lose podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We look forward to talking to you again soon. Mm-hmm.